from its annual symposium. This is the uh, Manji's lecture. Uh, a word uh, about the, uh, the person for whom the lecture is named. Uh, it was established by the law firm of Weil, Gottschall, and Manjis in 1986 in memory of its esteemed partner, Horace S. Manjis, who was a graduate of the Columbia Law School class of 1919. Generous contributions to the Horace S. Manjis Lecture and Conference Fund were made by Mr. Manjis' family, friends, colleagues, and other associates. Uh, Horace Manjis was a leading publishing lawyer and uh, an active participant in the round of copyright reform that led to the 1976 Copyright Act. As you know, we are in the throes of potential copyright reform, not only in the United States, but also at least possibly in the European Union. Uh, and uh, it is in that context that uh, we are very honored and delighted to have as our speaker this year Maria Martin Pratt, who is the head of the Copyright Union Unit in the European Commission Internal Market Directorate, also known as DG Marked. Her unit is responsible for the development and enforcement of EU rules in the area of copyright and related rights, as well as for international negotiations in bodies such as the World Intellectual Property Organization. Before joining the copyright unit, Ms. Martine Pratt was already a head of unit in DG Marked, responsible for free movement of services and freedom of establishment, and notably, the 2006 Services Directive. Prior experience in the commission includes being a member of the cabinet of Commissioner Joaquin Almunia, responsible at the time for economic and monetary affairs. Other work experience includes working in the private sector in London as the Director of Legal Policy for the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry and in the European Parliament where she was responsible for the European Parliament reports on the 1993 Cable and Satellite Directive and the 1993 Term of Protection Directive. Ms. Martin Pratt is admitted as a solicitor in Spain has two postgraduate degrees in European law, and most importantly, was an LLM student here at Columbia Law School uh, an undisclosed number of years ago. So it is my very, very great pleasure to welcome Maria Martin Pratt back to Columbia Law School for this Manji's lecture. Thank you, Jane, and thanks for not disclosing the number of years. <laughs> uh, the subject of my talk today is the future of copyright in Europe. Um, some will say that for such a future to exist, there is a need to reform copyright. Others will say that the best way to ensure any future for copyright is to refrain from intervention. My own view, as I'll try to explain, is that rational review of copyright rules is required to maintain the legitimacy of the system in Europe. I'm also of the view, but possibly you will expect that from the head of the copyright department in the European Commission, that such review needs to be done not at national, but at European level. So I would like to address the drivers and the key issues behind the ongoing discussions, as well as the possible steps going forward but before doing that, I think it's important, often as well when one speaks outside of Europe, to put all this in context. What is copyright for the European Union? It's important to understand the current debate and the options going forward. What do we talk about when we refer to the EU copyright rules? And even more important, why is it that we have EU copyright rules in the first place? There is not such a thing as a copyright code in Europe, let alone, unlike for other IP rights like patents or trademarks, a European title. Copyright continues to be fundamentally attached to the 28 jurisdictions that are the European Union today. And indeed, uh, when reading, say, the UK Copyright Design, Designs and Patents Act and, for instance, the French or the Spanish intellectual property codes, 
one finds important and divergent specificities on issues such as authorship and ownership, assignment of licensing of rights or limitations and exceptions. At the same time, we have a significant body of common rule. It's what we call the community acquis. This community acquis has developed now over 20 years. And the first community measure that we took in the area was back in 1991 with the software directive. The last one adopted, the last one so far, uh, was adopted two months ago, is the Directive on Collective Management of Rights. So right now, our body of common rules is made up of 10 pieces of legislation. And it's important to understand that these pieces of legislation are directives, i.e. these are legal instruments which are binding upon member states as to the results to be achieved, but leave to them the choice as to the form and the methods. So directive require the adoption of implementing measures at national level and in the area of copyright, logically, this intervention normally takes the form of amendments to the existing national copyright laws. So why do we do it? Why does the EU try to harmonize the copyright acts of its member states? The final goal is something that it is often forgotten by IP specialists, uh, but that is clearly established in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the establishment of an internal market, i.e. an area without internal frontiers for the free movement inter alia of goods and of services. Of course, there are public interest objectives that are taken into account when defining internal market policy, but the establishment of an internal market is the legal basis and the objective of our action. It is not always clear, as we shall see, whether this objective is met and whether the extent to which it is met suffices today. So the EU copyright rules have grown over the years, and they have done so a little bit organically, if we could say. Some directives have tackled specific issues in terms of the subject matter of protection, like the software directive or the directive on the protection of databases. Some have addressed specific rights, like the rental and lending rights directive, and some have addressed specific issues, like the two terms of protection directives. The 2001 directive, often referred to as the Information Society Directive or the Copyright Directive, is clearly the one that harmonizes rules in a more horizontal and systematic manner, establishing the rights, including those involved in digital transmissions, and the exceptions to rights of authors, performers, phonogram producers, film producers, and broadcasting organizations in Europe. It's also the one that establishes the legal protection of technological measures and of rights management information systems. And this possibly explains why in the ongoing debate in Europe for a review of copyright, very often people refer to a review of the Information Society Directive. They are synonymous for many. There are other two directives that should be seen as part of this universe. One is the 2004 Intellectual Property Rights Enforcement Directive, which applies to the enforcement of copyright. And the other is the 2000 E-Commerce Directive, which establishes safe harbors for internet service providers, including in the case of copyright infringement. And it is interesting to note that in the current debate in Europe, those advocating for the need to review copyright have also maintained that there is no need to review neither the enforcement nor the safe harbors for ISP liability. Now, where do we stand today? What is the reality of the application of the EU copyright rules? As explained, these rules are implemented by member states by modifications to their copyright laws, which as a result in Europe contain a fair amount of commonality. Uh, but they also, these national copyright rules, keep their national specificities. But it's correct to say that on the basis of the directives, we have established the main elements as regards the definition of the rights, the limitations, the exercise, and the enforcement. A number of these directives are intertwined. For instance, the protection of software or the protection of original databases is partly based on specific directives but since they are protected as works, protections for these things are also in the 2001 Information Society Directive, 
And this is sometimes the source of some degree of uncertainty. Notably, there have been recently some very important judgments of the Court of Justice on software and databases that have addressed horizontal, really cut, uh, cross-cutting horizontal issues, such as is there an exhaustion of the distribution right in digital copies acquired by transmission? In which territories does an act of making available take place? The extent to which the principles that the court in these judgments has developed apply to software and databases is not totally clear. So it was possibly unavoidable that the development of these different directives over 20 years will result in some inconsistency, and it was certainly unavoidable that such wide body of legislation will place the Court of Justice of the European Union at the center of the interpretation of copyright law in Europe. This sometimes surprises people. Indeed, in the last decade, the role of the court in copyright has grown exponentially, leading many scholars to conclude that the court is harmonizing through the back door. I shall not enter into this debate, but the reasons for the central role of the court are very clear. The adoption of the different directives has resulted in incorporating into the EU law a large number of basic copyright concepts, such as originality, communication to the public, fair compensation. These concepts, in turn, have become what the court defines as autonomous concepts of community law, i.e. concepts that, in view of the need for a uniform application of European Union law, must be given an independent and uniform interpretation throughout the European Union. Of course, the Berne Convention, the WIPO treaties, which form part of the Union legal regime because of the ratification of the treaties by the EU and its member states, these treaties will inform the interpretation the court does of these concepts, but they will not prevent the court going for further in its guidance, including to balance the protection of copyright with the protection of the basic freedoms of the treaty, including the freedom to provide services and the free movement of goods, and the fundamental rights protected by the Union legal order. So all in all, the role that's been taken by the court was to be foreseen, and it is normal. Certain concepts in copyright are always going to need development on the basis of case law. Indeed, there's been a number of cases lately where the same issues have been considered by courts in this country and by the Court of Justice. In parallel, Redigi here, USoft in Europe, Aereo here, and Catch-Up TV in Europe. These are examples of parallel but not convergent discussions on key copyright concepts by courts on both sides of the Atlantic. Having said that, there may also be sometimes a problem with national courts referring questions to the Court of Justice for preliminary rulings, as we call them, on issues that should already be sufficiently clear, for instance, on the scope of the concept of public performance, which has been tested in turn as regards hotel rooms, paths, thermal baths, private dental practices, circuses, and coverage shows. There are some of the more interesting cases where indeed what the court is doing comes very close to establishing new rules. For instance, as I mentioned earlier, in its 2012 use of judgment, the court ruled that the right of distribution of a copy of a computer program is exhausted if the copyright holder who has authorized the downloading of the copy has also conferred the right to use that copy for an unlimited period. So despite a very clear indication in the Information Society Directive that the question of exhaustion does not arise in the case of services and online services in particular, the court ruled that there is something like distribution by transmission in EU law, at least for software. In my view, the court was trying to bring back the copy of the computer program to the world of goods, i.e. to the distribution right. And the court was doing do this to facilitate the functioning of the single market because we have the principle of community exhaustion of the distribution right. And this is not the only instance in the last years where the court has intervened with a clear objective of removing obstacles to the single market. 
even if these require bending some copyright principles. And one of the copyright principles the court likes bending the most, sometimes, is territoriality. And territoriality can constitute a clear obstacle, in particular today with the development of line services to the freedom to provide services across border. And you can see in the 2011 Premier League cases how the court struck down legislation in the UK that prohibited the importation and selling of foreign decoders giving access to encrypted satellite broadcasting services from other member states. The legislation was being relied upon by broadcasters to enforce licenses agreements with absolute territorial exclusivity clauses which prevented cross-border access to the satellite broadcasting services. Again, the court was forcing the functioning of the single market. So we saw the court and we see the court shaping new copyright rules to inj inject a degree of internal market friendliness there where the legisl legislator or the market may have forgotten to do so. So now that we have set the scene as to what is copyright in Europe, uh, which are the drivers and the key issues? The debate about the review of the EU copyright rules have been ongoing in Europe for some time now, like here. This commission, i.e. the commission that's been in place between 2010 and now, has been very active in the area of copyright. We have negotiated and adopted two directives, the Open Works Directive and the Collectivized Management Directive, a memorandum of understanding on out-of-commerce works, a mediation process on the issue of private copy levies, and a stakeholder dialogue known under the name of Licenses for Europe. In parallel, we have undertaken a number of legal and economic studies, and in December last year, we launched a broad consultation process which closed last month. In the last few years, some member states have also launched national processes to assess the need to review their national copyright laws, but today, the ongoing legislation process in Europe constitute, to a large extent, the type of adjustments you will expect to happen from time to time in copyright legislation. And I should highlight at this point that any substantial update of copyright rules in the member states will need to be done at European level. Member states are locked in the process of harmonization that has taken place during the last two decades, as clearly transpires from the case law of the Court of Justice. The court has ruled that member states cannot give wider protection to copyright holders by defining the concepts are harmonized at EU level as including a wider range of activities that those refers to in the directives. And the concepts that have been harmonized are the most important ones, reproduction, distribution, communication to the public, making available. The logic behind the court reasoning is not a surprise. The objective of the directive is to eliminate legislative difference and legal uncertainty. Reintroducing these differences will adversely affect the functioning of the internal market. A related question that may be considered by the court in a pending preliminary ruling is whether member states can enlarge the category of right holders to which they grant the rights harmonized at EU level. And if I had to bet, I know what the court is likely to say. The same production of the margins of maneuvers of member states has happened as regards limitations to rights. The court has established case law which says that even when member states are free to introduce an exception into domestic law from the least established in the Information Society Directive, even when exercising this option, member states are not free to set conditions to the exception that will hamper its effectiveness and purpose and cannot set conditions in a manner that will vary from one member state to another and give rise to inconsistencies. Furthermore, as regards the balance to be achieved, the court has noted that in the context of the application of limitations and exceptions, a fair balance must be safeguarded between on the one hand, the rights of interest and interest of right holders and on the other, the rights of users, like the freedom of expression. So I think it is fair to conclude that any review of reform, if there is going to be one, will need to happen at EU level. So what are the main drivers? What are the main issues? Um, for us in Europe, uh, it's more than a decade since we adopted 
EU legislation to update rights uh, in digital networks, the 2011, sorry, the 2001 Information Society Directive, and the changes that have taken place with them in terms of technology and services, in terms of uses, and in terms of content are quite obvious for everybody. In terms of technology and services, we have witnessed the widespread of the internet access, the ubiquity of devices, the massive increase in memory storage, the development of peer-to-peer -peer technology, and the fact that social media and sharing platforms are parts of daily life for many of you. It is evident that the, this has placed considerable strain on copyright systems all over the world, since some of the basic concepts of copyright, the concept of copy, the concept of public, even the concept of a right to authorize or prohibit are clearly not always easy to apply in digital networks. This has led, in the view of some, to an overstretching of copyright, while others will argue that recognition and protection of rights is shrinking. In any event, these changes in Europe have raised questions related to the application of our broadly defined reproduction right and the quite technology-specific mandatory exception for temporary copies. Question as to whether it applies to cash copies, to copies that occur while browsing or receiving on a stream. It has also raised questions on the scope of the private copying exception as regards copies made from illegal sources, copies made as part of an online service that has been licensed by right holders, and copies made by third parties for consumers' private use. Other questions arise as regards the right of communication to the public and its application to hyperlinking. And this evolution of technology has also brought calls for new exceptions in Europe, notably as regards user-generated content and text and data mining. Uh, there are also calls, but this time from right holders, to review the liability safe harbors of the e-commerce directive, which they see as unbalanced and an obstacle to the enforcement of copyright online. So those are the changes in terms of technology and services. Which are the changes in terms of uses? Well, there seems to be, at least in Europe, a trend towards the dematerialization of content distribution. It's a shift from ownership to access-based consumption models. This is further supported by the development of cloud computing technology and subscription-based services. If you know a service like Spotify, it makes 90% of the music industry in Sweden. Um, but this change has brought uh, questions such as the exhaustion of rights online, issues related to contractual clauses and technological protection measures on the one hand, and limitations and exceptions on the other. These discussions are particularly difficult in my view. Um, it is difficult to conclude that users do not have property that they can dispose of over content acquired online. But it is equally difficult to assess the consequences of a second-hand market of perfect quality digital copies. Another area where there might be no easy equivalence between the offline and the online world relates to the limitations for the benefit of libraries and similar institutions where on the one hand, libraries see the new subscription access-based systems as an unjustified restraint on activities such as preservation or e-lending. And on the other hand, right holders fear that library services will become equivalent to commercial services, but under an exception. Finally, in Europe, all this triggers, yet again, discussions on private copy levies with calls for and against extending levies to cloud-based services, such as local services, and the technologies associated to them. Changes in terms of content now. Uh, what is obvious is that digitization and digital networks have multiplied the possibilities for the dissemination of, work, of works and make possible the bringing back to the public of works that will have otherwise not have been disseminated or will not longer have been disseminated. This, together with the lengthening of the terms of protection, has increased difficulties in the clearance of rights for sometimes of works, 
and in particular in the context of so-called mass digitization heritage projects. In the EU, this has prompted discussions on the need to resort systematically to extended collective licensing or similar mechanisms, and some are calling for an exception to allow for the dissemination of these works for cultural purposes. Needless to say that any action beyond facilitating voluntary licensing is opposed by right holders. The drivers and the issues I've just described, I think, are common to many jurisdictions. And besides them, there are some more specific EU drivers that I would like to highlight. There are three. Uh, one is territoriality. The other one is the level of harmonization of limitations and exceptions that we have reached at EU level. And the third one is flexibility. So let's start with territoriality. The question is whether territoriality affects the dissemination of and the access to copyright protected content in the European single market. If territoriality is not a new characteristic of copyright, why is it prominent now? In my view, it is because of the shift from goods to services as the means to disseminate copyright protected content. Free movement of goods is much more of a reality in Europe than free movement of services. And this is true also for copyright protected content and services. In the pre-digital networks era, we have managed to handle territoriality relatively well. The distribution of copyright protected content consisted mostly on the distribution of goods. And quite early, the Court of Justice established that a copyright holder cannot rely on the territoriality of national laws to prevent the importation of a product which has been lawfully marketed in another member state by the right holder himself or with his consent. That was the principle of exhaustion of the distribution right at community level. The acts of communication to the public that existed at the time state mostly with nas within national boundaries. We had some cases of cable retransmission, but it wasn't much. And when satellite broadcasting emerged, the EU legislator enacted the Cable and Satellite Directive, which establishes a legal fiction, according to which the act of communication to the public by satellite only takes place in the country where the program carrying signal originates. But today, the more the dissemination of content moves from goods to services via digital networks, i.e. from distribution to communication, the more the territoriality of copyright comes back to the forefront of discussions. Under European rules, digital transmissions are in principle covered by the making available right, which is seen as a subset of the communication right. This was established in the Information Society Directive but the directive is silent in terms of what constitutes an act of making available and where does the act of making available take place. Some clarity has been given in the recent Svensson case, dealing with the thorny issue of hyperlinks, which reaffirmed that the making available of a work to the public is sufficient irrespective of whether the members of the public avail themselves of that opportunity. Uncertainty remains, however, as to where the act of making available takes place. In all of the countries where the content can be or is accessed, only in those countries targeted by the communication. As mentioned before, the closest the Court of Justice has come to address this point has been in relation to the online access of a database, where it has said that the act of making available takes place at least in the countries where the act discloses an intention to target members of the public. Right holders tend to consider that territoriality is essential to ensure an adequate remuneration in Europe. Um, others fear, other fears relate to the limited existing harmonization on issues such as ownership or transfer rights or the uneven availability of certain remedies such as injunctive relief which may lead to situations where they, the right holders, feel are deprived of protection. From the point of view of users, from the point of view of consumers in Europe, territoriality is simply seen as an obstacle to the cross-border access and portability of content services in Europe. It gives a really bad name to copyright. So the definition of the rights relevant to digital transmission at the EU remain for the time being territorial. 
And the same happens actually with the definition of most limitations and exceptions, where it is undeniable that in Europe only a limited harmonization has been achieved. Whereas the catalog of limitations and exceptions in EU law is exhaustive, that means that no other exceptions can be applied by member states, these limitations are often optional in the sense that member states are free to reflect in their legislation as many or as few of them, of, of them as they wish. Moreover, the formulation of certain of the limitations and exceptions is general enough to give significant flexibility to the member states as to how and to what extent to implement them. So as a result, and despite the Court of Justice efforts to avoid this, there are considerable differences between European countries as regards, for instance, what libraries can do for the purposes of preservation or what teachers can use for the purposes of illustration. This situation is not surprising <coughs> as the definition of limitations and exceptions has always been seen as a matter specific to national legal systems, traditions and policy objectives. And possibly because of this situation, because of the lack of sufficient harmonization, the current rules do not provide for cross-border effect of exceptions. So, for instance, if a library makes a book available online under an exception in France, this does not mean that patrons residing in Belgium can benefit from their exceptions to access that book. So this situation may not have been much of a concern in the past, but today is increasingly being discussed as an obstacle to the cross-border use of works and for uses that could be increasingly frequent in a number of areas covered by exceptions, such as cross-border research, distant learning programs, cross-border exchange of accessible co format copies for persons with disabilities. So, another important specific U driver, flexibility. Flexibility is not something we do very well at U level. Calls to increase flexibility of copyright laws to adapt to the evolution of technology are commonplace today. And interestingly enough, flexibility is normally called upon only to expand the uses that can take place without right holders' consent. It could cut both ways, however. I think in any event that the quest for flexibility is a justified one, the difficulty is how to achieve it while keeping a sufficient degree of legal certainty and a fair balance between the interests of users and right holders, and in our case, the smooth functioning of the internal market. Most countries in Europe see that fair balance as something that needs to be determined by a legislative process, including the intervention of a parliament, not solely by judicial review. This leads me, this leads me of course, to the issue of fair use. Uh, you all know that fair use is increasingly presented outside of the US as the way forward to ensure that copyright evolves with technology and does not stifle innovation. It is also presented sometimes as providing for a degree of legal certainty equivalent to the one provided by exceptions, which is something that I think is questionable in precisely those areas of technological change and innovation which the advocates of fair use want to facilitate. The question gets even more complicated in the context of 28 jurisdiction, which is our context. Uh, in my personal view, it will not be unthinkable to give a larger degree of flexibility to judges in Europe when determining if certain uses should or not be restricted by copyright. But the question under this hypothetical scenario, and it's not a minor question, is how do you avoid courts in different member states going into very different directions? And for 20, for 30, for 40 years, how long does it take to develop a sufficient body of precedent. And what will the effects of this be in terms of legal certainty for the functioning of the national markets and the European market? And how long will it take for the Court of Justice to be simply collapse because of the number of references for preliminary ruling coming from courts in 28 different member states? So here we have a situation in Europe which is somewhat paradoxical, 
due to the closed list that I was explaining, the current EU system lacks flexibility as far as the introduction of new exceptions is concerned, while at the same time, the general, general formulation of some of these exceptions provides member states with a large margin of maneuver sometimes, but only at the national level and within the national borders. So maybe the answer to the question of flexibility in Europe starts by agreeing first at which level, national or European, the flexibility needs to be injected. There's yet another issue, which is complex to define, but is clearly becoming a driver in the European debate. Maybe by many, it will be seen as a very European concern. Largely, it could be referred to as the sharing of the value in the internet chain. And it's basically the idea that uh, many right holders held that the value of the exploitation of, prote of protected content in the internet is not being fairly shared. And it is basically being taken by platforms and other internet intermediaries to the detriment of those that create and invest in protected content. Now, this is an extremely difficult debate, in particular in a free market economy, uh, and when those being accused are not engaging into illegal activities, it is nevertheless there and reflects a reality on the ground, whether justified or not. This discussion is also often mixed with another one that in my view merits a separate debate, the fair remuneration of individual creators, i.e. of authors and performers. Which are the best mechanisms to achieve it? This debate is relevant not only for the online, it's also for the offline environment and relates largely to the relation between individual creators, producers and publishers. In all, these two issues drive calls in some member states for remuneration rights that can be claimed directly from the user, for instance, from a uh, download or streaming platform, for an expansion of the system of levies or for equi equ equivalent mechanisms, for instance, in the form of licenses to be paid by internet access providers. These are not generalized calls in Europe, but uh, they come and go. Now, as to the next steps. Uh, in the description of the drivers of the debate, you can already identify most of the issues that are at the, at the center of discussion in Europe. As mentioned earlier, a number of them have been subject to recent studies and a stakeholders dialogues. And in addition, we launched, as I mentioned, a public consultation, which we recently closed and had a large scope uh, in terms of the subject covered and a large uh, um, number of replies, 11,171. Um, now, uh, the assessment of the replies to the consultation is, is ongoing as we speak. <laughs> we are gonna resort to text and data mining. And so are the political discussions uh, within the European Commission as to the next steps in this process. We are in Europe at the end of a political cycle, so the next step likely to be taken by this commission is a policy document, possibly a white paper, to identify issues and help in framing the debate and decisions for the next commission. The European Parliament elections are in May. The next commission should be placed by the end of the year. So at this stage, I can only give you a personal impression of the general objectives and form that the possible future intervention at EU level should have. As to the objectives, we should make sure the definition of the rights is as clear as possible and as legal technology specific as possible. This is as obvious an objective as it is difficult to achieve. If we were to start from scratch, I think many of us will plead for abandoning a system based on separate, separate reproduction and distribution or communication rights with all the subcategories to the communication rights that over the years have been developed and just have an exploitation right. However, at this stage, it seems too difficult to get to that point without seriously disrupting functioning markets as well as the balances and compromises built around some of these concepts. It is nevertheless, nevertheless undeniable that the more technology accelerates the less copyright should rely in technology-bound concepts. What is the purpose and the meaning of a temporary copy? 
Will there continue to be copies? Does it make sense to keep relying on the concept of on demand to define certain rights? Should on demand relate to the triggering of a transmission or to the fact that the content is there in any event at any time? At least we could start uh, by enhancing clarity in the definition of the rights which we have harmonized at EU level because as discussed before, there are a number of questions relating to the definition and boundaries of the reproduction and communication right, uh, which are not clear. Now, second objective, we should more fully develop the internal market in the European copyright system. We will need to consider this in relation to the definition and the licensing of rights to facilitate cross-border access to and portability of services. The challenge here is how to do so while taking into account the importance of the territorial exploitation of rights for certain sectors and the difficulties in defining in legislation the criteria to balance the protection of copyright and contractual freedom on the one hand with the need to avoid unjustified restrictions to the freedom to provide services on the other. These discussions will also need an assessment of whether we have the required level of harmonization to ensure that measures to do away with territoriality do not also do away with the protection of some right holders in some territories. Um, getting more internal market in the European copyright system also implies examining whether the current system of enforcement of rights is equipped to function across borders, i.e. across jurisdictions. And finally, as regards limitations, once we determine which are the most important limitations to further harmonize because of their public policy objective and the cross-border use potential, we should need to establish mechanism, for instance, mutual recognition to ensure that an act covered by an exception in a member state is also recognized as being so in another member state. We should also consider further steps to facilitate the digitizing and dissemination of European cultural heritage. We already have in place some of the pieces of the GINSO. We have the Orphan Wars Directive and the Memorandum of Understanding on out-of-commerce books and learned journals. But in my view, further efforts are needed in certain sectors where difficulties associated with the clearance of rights seem undeniable, like in the case of audiovisual works out of distribution, like films and documentaries and photographs. Different mechanisms could be considered. Uh, the difficulty here will be to define mechanisms that are compatible with the fact that online rights are exclusive, and that is what the Bering Convention and the WIPO Treaty say. And finally, we should consider two more objectives that, although are not often raised in the discussions in Europe about the review of copyright at the moment, I think are important for, as part of a balanced and fair discussion. One is the need to improve enforcement mechanisms as regards centrally infringement committed with a commercial purpose. And we also need to identify measures to help ensuring the fair compensation of individual creators. So these are the subjects. What is the form? How could we do that? There are two options going forward. For one, we might take another step in the process of harmonizing EU rules based this time on a higher level of harmonization, uh, but still on the basis of a directive. Uh, we could have a directive of a similar horizontal nature that the 2001 directive that will clarify and when necessary update or change not only the 2001 directive, but possibly other directives. For instance, very likely the databases directive. The other option is a copyright code. And this will need to take the form of a regulation, not a directive, i.e. an instrument that is of direct application once adopted at EU level in the member states. And that regulation will establish a European copyright title and the conditions attached to it. That European code will replace member states' copyright laws. And some will say that this is an impossible goal which is close to being, but uh, there might be a reason to do it. In any event, what is very clear is that it is a goal that will take a considerable amount of time to reach 
and that will face some formidable obstacles besides the member states. Uh, one of them is that it would possibly require the establishment of a specialized jurisdiction, and that is another discussion. So in conclusion, uh, well, the last 10 years have not been easy for copyright in Europe, but possibly nowhere. Uh, the idea that copyright is an instrument required to incentivize and reward creativity as much as to facilitate access to culture, knowledge, and entertainment has often been challenged, and many have denied the harm that piracy inflicts on the industry and those that want to be remunerated for the work. Copyright has been portrayed by some as an obstacle to innovation and equally important if part of the public does not understand what copyright does or does not do, and as a result, does not see any merit in respecting it. At the same time, it is undeniable that in the last 10 years, there has been an explosion of new and innovative means to legally disseminate copyright protected content, and that today there is more, no less, more legal access to culture, to knowledge, and entertainment than ever before. In my view, going forward will require rebalancing and de-dramatizing the debate. To do so, we will need a common acknowledgement of the value of copyright for society as a whole and an understanding of the fact that rights are meaningless unless they are respected and there is the possibility to enforce them. But in parallel, we will also need a common acknowledgement that the current rules may need clarification or readjustment when their application in the digital environment leads to unwanted results. And we should have the willingness to discuss the updating of limitations and exceptions in light of the changes in technology and in uses. In Europe, we will also have to convince everybody, and this includes the member states, that the single market is an opportunity for all of the stakeholders in this debate. So copyright is likely to remain high on the political agenda in Europe. The opportunity to do a meaningful review of our rules may be ahead of us during the next five years political cycle once a new European Parliament is elected and a new president of the Commission and a college of commissioners are in place. It will require some vision and a strong political commitment. Wish us luck. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions, so. Uh, Can I just ask, um, since y'all have mics at the desk and this is being recorded, so if you could speak loudly and clearly, and if, for, if you could repeat the question into a microphone. That would be great. Thank you. And, and please identify yourself when you ask a question. <laughs> no, I'll be dead, actually. <laughs> Okay, I think the question is if is whether I'm going to be alive and in my job. Uh, and, and the answer is no, I won't be alive. And no, I am not Director General yet. I'm the head of the copyright department, so my job normally doesn't change. So are there actual any efforts, serious efforts to be made where the copyright code would be identified in Europe? Um, efforts towards a European copyright code in Europe. Uh, at the level of academia, yes, there is the Witten project that was developed by a, num a number of professors. Uh, that some people will praise and some people will consider that it's not balanced enough, but for the time being it's stayed as a theoretical project at academic level. Um, ideally, it will be very good to have a single title, the same rules applying through the whole territory. We have now a very diverse situation. Um, getting there is something that it will be 
so difficult that I think at least the first step should be further harmonization before getting there. So the question being as to the divergences I was referring to uh, in developments on both sides of the Atlantic, whether this has an effect on development of uh, copyright uh, in Europe. I did refer to divergences in two specific rulings because they have been very recent and on two very topical issues. Uh, communication to the public when there is a communication to the public and exhaustion of the distribution right in the, in the case of transmission of digital files. In these two cases, Europe and the United States have gotten to different conclusions, but that is not the same as me saying that we have divergent directions in the general discussion. When you when you see uh, the discussions and the issues identified here in the United States, for instance, in the uh, quite recently published USPTO Green Paper on copyright, and when you see the type of discussions we've been having, if you look at our public consultation, they're not that different. I mean, there are specificities. Our systems are, in some respects, different. Uh, we, for instance, rely much more in collective management of rights that you do here in the States. Um, we do not have fair use, and you do, which sometimes I wish we had it, because like that, I don't have to think as to how you have to uh, cost prepare specific exceptions for specific types of uses. But, but despite all that, I think if you look at discussions, they come about the same. They're about uh, the definition of the rights, they're about the world, often works, about mass digitization, about libraries and archives, um, about enforcement. Um, so they are not that different in my view. And we have moral rights. I don't know if you have that. <laughs> Neither do we. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so the question is uh, the role of moral rights, whether they help or hindrance uh, <coughs> content uh, being distributed uh, in Europe. Um, I don't have a sense of it being a problem. Um, moral right has traditionally been an issue where the European Union has said well, we don't do this because it's not an economic right. Uh, so traditionally, we have stayed away from the issue of moral rights also because if you ever try to get agreement between, say, the French and the UK view as to moral rights, it will take a long time. My view is that going forward, issues such as integrity and the right of attribution are going to be increasingly important to the point that it would be very difficult to say that there is not an economic aspect to it. So maybe we should add moral rights to the next directive that we will put on the table. But I think moral rights are going to be increasingly important. You see it already in the discussions we have been having about user-generated content. One of the main preoccupations about those that create content and upload it is the fact that uh, they find it very, very difficult to maintain an attribution in particular on issues such as photography and others. So, but so far, if you were to ask any member states, they would say none of the European Union business. We'll see. Professor Stepos, 
Okay, I feel like being back in Brussels for a minute. <laughs> I'm not in New York. Okay, the question, to put it in a nutshell, is uh, the single market is going to be for the Americans. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that is said with all due respect. Uh, but no, 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 the question, is, the question is not an easy one. Uh, is there a single offer? Is there a single demand? But I don't think that's the point. Of course, uh, there is not a single offer or a single demand, and there's never going to be. Uh, the importance of American repertoire in Europe is not as high as many people think. Uh, Europeans remain stubbornly local sometimes. Uh, so the question is, well then, why do you want to do anything? I mean, the, the reason why we want to facilitate the function of a single market is also to provide that single market to people producing and creating in Europe. We're not gonna force people in Italy to listen to German heavy metal, uh, <laughs> or, or people in I don't know, Ireland to listen to Portuguese fado, but, um, but the current situation, it is, it is a very fragmented one that is bad for everybody. It's fragmented in the way it provides a license, so it makes it much more difficult uh, for anyone that is a startup and wants to start providing services to get the required rights. It is bad for those that want to have access to content and these days, if people want to have access to content, they're going to have access to content. If you don't have a legitimate offer, you're going to go for another one. And if people want to watch American uh, TV series, they're going to watch American TV series, whether Netflix has deployed their services in their country or not. So in a way, uh, that internal market there is also an opportunity for the big and for the small. We cannot force an internal market. You were referring to the satellite directive, and that's correct. When, when we adopted the uh, cable and satellite directive, uh, we said, as I was explaining, the act of communication to the public by satellite happens only in one country, the country of public of the broadcast. This was the 1990s, and we thought that the future of Europe was the pan-European broadcasting service, and everybody was going to watch the same uh, very European broadcast services. It did not happen. Even MTV went back to local uh, in different um, in different uh, in different countries. So it is correct to say it did not trigger the pan-European uh, service. Having said that, and that you can read when you read, for instance, the Premier League cases that I was referring to, it's partly because although in law we try to do away with territoriality by applying a fiction of country of origin. The, ter the territoriality was revealed in the contracts that were concluded between the producers and the distributors. And generally speaking, and that's why I was saying in my intervention, this gives a bad name to copyright. If you are European, you are used to, at the time there were record shops, there are none left, to go, I don't know, you lived in France, you went to London and you bought in Tower Records uh, a few records. Um, it's very difficult to understand that you cannot do the same online. It's very difficult to want to go to a website and be denied access or being redirected to your local website without having the possibility to shop around and decide what you want to have access to and at which prices. All these things are neither good for the internal market, not for copyright. I'm not an internal market fundamentalist, 
but I think a little bit of internal market. In the end, that's what I said at the, at the beginning of my intervention. That's our legal basis. I know that it sounds uh, strange for some people. We do not have a mandate to harmonize IP. We have a mandate to make that market functions a bit better because we believe it's the way for the continent to also work a bit better. But uh, anyway, it's not going to be simple to do away with territoriality, but uh, we should try a little bit. So on that note, uh, I'd like once again to thank Maria Martin-Pratt for her lecture. <laughs>